Welcome to Delighting in the Trinity with Michael Reeves, brought to you by Union. This podcast brings you teaching and preaching from our archives, and you can find more resources, audio, video, and books at unionpublishing.org. Good evening, dear friends. Let's pray, shall we, that the Lord takes and uses Charles Spurgeon again in our lives now. O oh, almighty God and Father, we ask you that you would once again use Charles Spurgeon, use his brokenness and the strengths you gave him to transform us, to fill us with joy in Christ and no fuller life in him. Give us greater wisdom through Charles Spurgeon, we pray, for our joy and for the glory of Jesus. Amen. Charles Spurgeon is known for being a big presence in the pulpit, but he was also everywhere a man who fizzed with life. In life, he laughed and he cried much. He read avidly. He felt deeply. He was a zealous, industrious worker and a a lover of society and play and beauty. And what I want us to see in our little time together now is I want to see that Spurgeon's aliveness, his vitality, his sheer liveliness of character, while it was expressed in ways that were particular to him, it was not a mere matter of the personality he was born with. It was an expression, an embodiment of his theology. And so what I want to do is not show you quite a biography of Spurgeon. I want to go behind closed doors with you to try to understand the character of the man, to see just something of how alive Spurgeon was And then when we've seen something of the man and his character, I then want to move to see how that liveliness came from his theology. So the man, Spurgeon was a big-hearted man of deep affections. And not just in the pulpit. I've had the great pleasure and privilege of being able to go through his personal letters to his his father, to his family, to his friends. And you see in those personal letters, he never thought people like me would get to read. And, And he's caring about exactly the same things he cares about in the pulpit and expresses emotion in just the same way as he does in the pulpit. He's just the same man. And perhaps the best insight into Spurgeon's character comes through an introduction he once gave to his equally large-framed friend, that's going to be important, by the way, John Bost. He called John Bost a man after our own heart. And when he introduced Bost, he gave what really amounts to, I think, what is the most revealing self-description. Even though he's describing his friend, it's really a self-description. Here's what he says. John Bost is great, as well as large. (laughs) Here is a man after our own heart with a lot of human nature in him, a large-hearted, tempest-tossed mortal who's done business on the great waters and who would long ago have been wrecked if it had not been for his simple reliance upon God. 
His is a soul like that of Martin Luther, full of emotion and mental changes, born aloft to heaven at one time and anon sinking into the deeps. Worn down with labor, he needs rest, but will not take it, perhaps cannot. I found him full of zeal and devotion, brimming over with godly experience, and at the same time abounding in mirth, racy remark, and mother wit. There, I think, is a self-description by Spurgeon, and it's revealing his honest, his honest acknowledgement of Bost's and his own depression and struggle with depression and melancholy. Because for Spurgeon to be large-hearted with a lot of human nature about him in this fallen world does not mean being a triumphalist, cheerily blustering past all difficulty. Spurgeon couldn't have done that. Spurgeon was a tender-hearted man. Being tender-hearted, he confessed publicly that he was temperamentally prone to be fearful. And that's worth hanging on to because we'll see some interesting, completely different perspectives to that. He was temperamentally prone to be fearful. He was tender-hearted. But that tender-heartedness shouldn't be confused with weakness. He would express his love for Christ, for people, but he could also express a real hatred for wickedness and injustice. So he would speak a number of times of how he would boil with anger at pastoral abuse, church politicking, false teaching. And you know, I think the tenderness saved him for it kept what was otherwise a natural robustness of character. It prevented that from allowing him to steamroll people. And so he had this fascinating blend of vigor and tenderness. And that makes him fascinatingly feisty <laughs> in showing compassion. It's quite an unusual thing. Let me read you um, a tiny little letter he wrote to his publisher. He wrote this. Dear Mr. Passmore, when that good little lad came here on Monday with a sermon, uh, he was publishing his sermon, so it would go, to, go off to the publisher and then the proof would get sent back to him. And so a little delivery boy was being sent with the proof. It was needful, but please blow someone up for sending the poor little creature here late at night all in the snow, with a parcel much heavier than he ought to carry. He couldn't get home till 11, I fear, and I feel like a cruel brute in being the innocent cause of having a poor lad out at such an hour on such a night. There was no need for it. Do kick someone for me. <laughs> Yours ever heartily, C.H. Spurgeon. Caring, playful, Genial. It was a benevolent large heartedness. And that was an aspect of Christ likeness that Spurgeon wanted to see in all pastors. He believed it was an essential requisite for pastors. He said this in his lectures to his students. He said, It is not every preacher you actually want to talk with. But there are some you'd give a fortune to converse with for an hour. I love a minister whose face invites me to be his friend. A man on whose doorstep you read, welcome. And you feel there's no need for that grave warning, beware of the dog. <laughs> he said, I've met somewhere with the observation that to be a popular preacher, one must have bowels. I fear the observation was meant as a mild criticism upon the bulk to which certain brethren have attained. But there is truth in it. A man must have a great heart if he would have a great congregation. His heart 
should be as capacious as those noble harbors along our coast which contain sea room for a fleet. And when a man has a large, loving heart, men go to him as ships to a harbor, and they feel at peace when they've anchored under the lee of his friendship. And such a man is hearty in private as well as in public. No, his blood is not cold and fishy. He is warm as your own fireside. No pride and selfishness chill you when you approach him. He has all his doors open to receive you, and you're at home with him at once. Such men I would persuade you students to be, every one of you. Spurgeon was also an unmistakably and deliberately earnest man with a deep concern for the glory of Christ and for the fate of the lost. He believed Christians should be able to say with our master, zeal for your house will consume me. But... Earnestness and zeal for Spurgeon were never to be confused with gloominess and melancholy. And therefore it's a, a telling thing that an entire chapter of what's called his autobiography, it's really his biography, an entire chapter is entitled Pure Fun. And it's a reason why he was so magnetic. Spurgeon was benevolent, genial, and fun. There was a playfulness, a, a, a sprightly aliveness to him. What a bubbling fountain of humor Mr. Spurgeon had, said his friend William Williams. I've laughed more, and I verily believe, when in Spurgeon's company than during all the rest of my life besides. And now few actually expected to laugh quite so much in the company of the great and zealous pastor. And Spurgeon knew this, and he seemed to take a, an impish delight in springing comedy on those around him. So, pride, grandiosity, religiosity, humbug could all expect to be pricked on his humor. And pride brought down. But that, the, the natural humor in him could actually be a challenge, he recognized. Um, there was one time he'd cracked a joke in the pulpit and someone criticized him for it and he said, if you knew how many others I kept back, you wouldn't have found fault with that one. <laughs> you would have commended me for the restraint I'd exercised for were I not watchful, I should become too hilarious. <laughs> and yet, it would be entirely inadequate and superficial just to think of Spurgeon as a clown, as a joker, to yuck it up. <laughs> I, I don't know what that means. It sounds disgusting. <laughs> Humor, Spurgeon believed, is normally the fruit of something deeper. Sometimes it can just come from high spirits. And he admitted sometimes that was a temperamental challenge for him, sometimes. At other times, humor is the defense mechanism of the sad. Or it's a cruel weapon of the proud or the insecure. Sometimes it can be brandished as a sneer, a sarcastic put down. Sometimes humor can be the bright weapon of righteousness, lancing both gloom and sin. And so Spurgeon said, I do believe in my heart there may be as much holiness in a laugh as in a cry, and that sometimes to laugh is the better thing of the two. 
Most essentially, though, Spurgeon's sunny manner was a manifestation of that happiness, that cheer, which is found in Christ, the light of the world, who would have his joy in us. His cheer, Spurgeon's cheer, was inextricably related to his clear refusal to take himself too seriously. Spurgeon held that to be alive in Christ means not only to fight the habits and the acts of sin, it also means to fight sin's temperamental sullenness, ingratitude, bitterness, despair. Those are where sin takes you. To enter into Christ's life means entering into the joy of being ever more fully human. More at peace with the blessed or happy God of glory. Spurgeon said, Man was not originally made to mourn. He was made to rejoice. God made human beings to be happy. They are capable of happiness. They're in their right element when they're happy. And now that Jesus Christ has come to restore the ruins of the fall, he's come to bring us back to the old joy. Only it shall be even sweeter and deeper than it could have been if we'd never lost it. Isn't that wonderful? He said, a Christian has never realized fully what Christ came to make him until he's grasped the joy of the Lord. Christ wishes his people to be happy. And when they are perfect, as he will make them in due time, they shall be perfectly happy. As heaven is the place of pure holiness, it is the place of unalloyed happiness happiness and in proportion as we get ready for heaven we shall have some of the joy which belongs to heaven and seeing that Christ wishes his people to be happy Spurgeon saw happiness was vital in the Christian life And it was something he sought avidly to possess and display. He believed only when Christ's joy is in us can we be said to be Christ-like. You are not Christ-like unless you share Christ's joy. But there was one way in which Spurgeon was less than full of life. He was naturally quite unathletic. He was prone from childhood to be quite physically timid, unadventurous. And here's the interesting way in which God changed him. That was his natural constitution. But... His view of the Christian life then gave him a boldness which was really quite unnatural to his born constitution. Because he saw in Christ he was adopted, loved by an omnipotent father who reigns sovereign over all things, meaning that everything fearful, opposition, danger, tended to shrink in Spurgeon's sight. For when rightly viewed, he saw nothing can cause despair. For everything exists under the almighty hand of God our Father, ruler on high. And so where, for example, the the young Martin Luther was terrified of lightnings. Spurgeon declared this. He said, I love the lightnings. God's thunder is my delight. 
He said, men are by nature afraid of the heavens, Luther. The superstitions, they dread the signs in the sky, and even the bravest spirit is sometimes made to tremble when the firmament is ablaze with lightning and the pealing thunder seems to make the vast concave of heaven tremble and to reverberate. But I always feel ashamed to keep indoors when the thunder shakes the solid earth and the lightnings flash like arrows from the sky, for then God is abroad. And I love to walk out in some wide space and to look up and mark the opening gates in heaven as the lightning reveals far beyond and enables me to gaze into the unseen. I like to hear my heavenly Father's voice in the thunder. For what was there for him to fear in all the awesome forces of a storm? All of that, merely the tools, the expressions of his perfect and loving, omnipotent Father. And seeing also that all things are the Father's and have their being from him gave Spurgeon the broadest interest in creation. He was brought up in the countryside. I was brought up less than three miles from where he was brought up. I know the big skies of his childhood. And he loved to go out and uh, in his garden enjoy the trees and the birds, rainbows, all creation. And when he couldn't be outside, he, he loved to read and read extensively because since this is our father's world, he believed Christians should be an omnivorous people of comprehensive intellect, interested in all our father's house. What was the theology that made Spurgeon so alive? That he could be so feisty in showing compassion, so tender and so bold, so voracious in wanting to read and, and see joy, see the marks of his creator in creation. What was it? I think if I'm to try to boil it down to absolute essentials, it was his understanding of the spirit, who, as he liked to put it in the old language of the authorized version, the spirit quickens us. And that quickening means that we are not simply given a new existence in Christ. We, we are given a life, which means vitality. And since we've been given this life, he must, he argued, we must live with all the possible energy of life. That, he said, is characteristic of the life of Christ himself. Christ was never slothful. Christ never lived for ease. And thus he said, we grow in our sense of oneness to Christ when we live all out for him. And the thought of enjoying Christ more through sharing his mission was a strong motivation for Spurgeon. He said, I delight in working for my Lord and Master because I feel a blessed community of interest with him. It's communion with Christ. And so bright, one might even say gleeful activity characterized his life. And so on top of his preaching, his pastoral ministry, he established and oversaw a host of ministries, including the pastor's college, 
the Stockwell Orphanage, 17 almshouses for the poor and elderly women, a day school for children. He was involved in the planting of 187 churches. And none of that is yet to have mentioned any of his books. Ah, his books. Yes, temperamentally, Spurgeon was impatient in his energy. And Spurgeon chafed at having to sit in his study writing. He said, Ah, it is a delight, a joy, a rapture to talk out my thoughts in words that flash upon the mind at the instant when they're required. But it is a poor drudgery to sit still and groan for thoughts and words without succeeding in obtaining them. Well, may a man's books be called his works. <laughs> but while Spurgeon was an activist in his own inimitable way. He was adamant Christian activism was the fruit of his theology, not simply his temperament. He said, a Christian sluggard, is there such a thing? A Christian man on half time? A Christian man working not at all for his Lord? How shall I speak of him? Time does not tarry. Death does not tarry. Hell does not tarry. Satan is not lazy. All the powers of darkness are busy. How is it that you and I can be sluggish if the master has put us into the vineyard? The Christian life is one of sharing the self-giving life of God. It must then be a proactive and proactively generous life, committed to blessing others. That's the godly life. And then you experience more richly God's own joy. For that is the new life of the Spirit. The Spirit, said Spurgeon, is... This is, an, this is an important little observation. He says, the spirit with which we're anointed, the spirit is the self-same spirit which abode without measure on our Lord Jesus Christ. So we have a union of experience with Christ in the fact that the same oil, the spirit, the same oil which anointed him anoints us. And so... What he's seeing is that as the Son of God is dynamically fully alive in the Spirit, so he makes the children of God energetic, active, spiritually, active. And so the idea of a passive Christian, content in sin, content not to know God better, this was simply anathema to Spurgeon's understanding of the Spirit. He said, no, wherever the grace of God is, it makes a difference. But the difference the Spirit makes is a deep one, not a superficial one. For the Spirit does not merely affect our behavior. Spurgeon's clear on this. The Spirit goes deeper to do work on our hearts and their desires, the loves that then drive our actions and behaviors. Listen to this comparison. Spurgeon said, Morality does but skim the surface. Holiness goes into the very caverns of the great deep. Holiness requires that the heart be set on God, that it shall beat with love for him. The moral man may be complete in his morality without that. Methinks I might draw, I love it being able to say that, methinks, I might draw such a parallel as this. Morality is a sweet, fair corpse. Well washed, robed, even embalmed in spices. Holiness is the living man. As fair and lovely as the other, but having life. 
Morality lies there of the earth, earthy, soon to be food for corruption and worms. Holiness awaits and pants with heavenly aspirations, prepared to mount and dwell in immortality beyond the stars. And these twain are of opposite nature. The one, morality, belongs to the world. The other belongs to that world beyond the skies. And so it is not said in heaven, moral, 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 art thou, O God? (laughs) But holy, 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 O Lord. You note the difference between the two at once. The one, how icy cold. The other, I quote literally, Oh, how animated is holiness. The spirit then of holiness is about wooing and inflaming and turning hearts so that believers might not simply act differently, but think and want and love differently and therefore act differently. He said, the statutes of the Lord are the delights of his saints. So this spirit gives the children of God new loves. He takes away the love of sin and implants a love for God and his holy ways. But as Spurgeon saw it, the heart of the spirit's enlivening is the cultivation of a growing delight. This is the heart of the Spirit's enlivening. A growing delight. Spurgeon asked, what is the gospel? Glad tidings of great joy. And why? For the gospel reveals a happy God. And the happiness of God was a theme that Spurgeon would return to again and again and again. He held, I quote, it enters into the essential idea of God that he is superlatively blessed. We cannot conceive of a God who should be infinitely miserable. Be, be super self-sufficient infinitely full of happiness. God is a God who delights to share his happiness. He's so more than sufficient. And he created us for that reason. Spurgeon said, he is the happy God. Ineffable bliss is the atmosphere in which he lives. And he would have his people to be happy. For a joyous God desires a joyous people. That's what changed Spurgeon. The Christian life then is one of entering into what Spurgeon called the truest and noblest immortality. Whereby we live as God liveth. In peace and joy and happiness. That's entering into God's joy. That's what we're made for. And above all the blessings that would make us happy, of all the blessings of salvation, adoption, the object, the great object of our joy is God himself. Spurgeon said, he is everything to us, our joy, our hope, our all, our bliss. Oh, friends, hear this. Our bliss depends not upon what we are in ourselves, but upon what he is in himself. He said the life of the believer is delight in God. And thus, true religion must overflow with happiness and joy. We do not fear God because of any compulsion, 
Our faith is no fetter. Our profession is no bondage. We are not dragged to holiness nor driven to duty. No, our piety is our pleasure. Our hope is our happiness. Our duty is our delight. As Spurgeon saw it, joy in God is of the essence of Christian vitality. And as such, he would connect it to every aspect of holiness. And this would be really quite striking. Spurgeon would connect the enjoyment of God with both jealousy and fear. For he believed joy in God makes us jealous for Christ. Joy in God gives us a stern intolerance for all, over all the sin that would grieve him. And joy in God is also instrumental in that most sacred motive, the fear of the Lord. For a true enjoyment of an appreciation of God produces a holy fear of God. And Spurgeon clarified this most helpfully. He said, this right fear of God is not the sort of fear a criminal would have before a judge. That's not what the Bible exhorts. It's not the sort of fear a child has before a monster. No, Spurgeon said, it is the fear which bows the tall archangel in adoration before the throne. It is the fear which makes the cherub veil his face with his wings while he adores his Lord. And that growing pleasure in God that the Christian enjoys has a flip side, a necessary one. For the more desire for God and his righteousness we have, the more disgust at sin we will have. Once we fled sin merely out of fear of punishment. Increasingly, we flee, it, we flee it out of fear of itself. Sin itself begins to horrify, to disgust us. And yet, Spurgeon said, our sorrow for sin is a sweet sorrow. For while the battle is hard against sin, while the presence of sin in us is so offensive to us, we enjoy opposing the darkness, for we're on the side of light. Spurgeon once confessed this. I wonder if you can resonate with this. Spurgeon said, I do not know, beloved, when I'm more perfectly happy than when I'm weeping for sin at the foot of the cross. Do you know that? Uh, a fresh vision of the cross makes you weep. You see afresh the magnitude of your sin. And in the very same sight of the cross, you see the magnitude and majesty of his grace and mercy. And both overwhelm you at once. And you happily weep. And that is the tear-shedding joy brought by the Spirit. We are made to be happy in Christ. Joy is an essential part of human health, he said. It is in that sense the handmaiden of holiness. Spurgeon said that joy in the Lord has the power to strengthen believers against temptation. Because when we find our happiness and satisfaction in him, we'll not seek it elsewhere. 
joy, he believed, has a medicinal power to cure the ills that come from grumbling. It therefore has the ability to drive away quarreling and promote peace. It is the cure for fretfulness and anxiety. And he said, cheer is a contagious good. Cheerfulness in one, spreading to others, spreading its benefits. And for these reasons, Spurgeon said, in every year in the ministry, he grew more confident, I quote, the joy of the Lord is and must be our strength. Discontent and moroseness are fatal to usefulness. In fact, I'm still quoting, joy is the sign and symbol of strong spiritual life. Because it's impossible to enjoy close communion with the happy God and not be affected. God's presence is transformative. Christians must then, he argued, fight for joy. Fight for that intimacy with God which fosters joy. And, and what's so interesting in that theology is, remember, Spurgeon's own personal inclination was towards melancholy and depression. It's not just how, how the man is wired. That he's, that's not the reason he's saying it. He knew despondency from personal experience has a leeching effect on us. It saps vitality. It replaces praise and thanksgiving with a grumble. He knew that's where he was inclined to go. So we must fight for joy. Now here I suggest, friends, is a theology that Spurgeon in his own life proved to be vitalizing. In Christ, we are partakers of his spirit anointing. Sharers in the sonship that he enjoys before the Father. We share his oil of gladness. And that is news of the deepest liberation. In Christ, those who were bored, the despondent, the unsatisfied, in Christ, they can know bold purpose, happy contentment. And they can know spirited life. Let's pray. Father, we praise you for this man who proved in his own life that such life is to be found in Christ. And would you help us to press in to fight for that joy that he found and so fight against sin's grumbling, despairing, melancholy nature and looking to Christ and Christ crucified find a tear-shedding, overwhelming, transforming, life-giving joy. In Jesus' sweet and strong name we pray it. Amen. You've been listening to Delighting in the Trinity with Michael Reeves, brought to you by Union. Union is devoted to growing leaders and growing churches. Our School of Theology equips leaders for ministry. Union Publishing supplies them and their churches with quality theological resources and books. Union Mission supports and financially helps church planting and revitalisation. And Newton House, Oxford, invests in the next generation of theologians and scholars. Our vision is to see leaders and their churches the world over reformed and renewed in the Gospel of Jesus Christ. To find out about our courses and learning communities around the world, to buy Union books, 
to discover support for your church plant or to become a friend of Union and support our ministry, visit www.viola.gy.